Uh, my name is Dave Myatt. I'm one of the Healthcare Business Association's conference directors. And before we get started, I'd just like to let you all know that if you would like to submit a question for the panelists, to please use the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring that throughout the panel and time permitting, we'll try to get to as many of those questions we can, um, as many questions as we can at the end. Uh, now I'd like to take a couple minutes and just introduce our panelists. So we have Troy Wilson. Troy is a serial biotech entrepreneur who is currently the co-founder and CEO of Cura Oncology, a publicly traded biotechnology firm dedicated to realizing the promise of precision medicines for the treatment of cancer. He's also the chairman of the board of Avidity Biosciences and has held a number of industry leadership and board positions. Mike Wisga has over 30 years of experience in the biotechnology industry. He is currently the president of MSW Consulting, a strategic biotechnology consulting firm. He has previously served as the executive vice president and CFO of Genzyme, as well as the CEO of Radius Health, a publicly traded biopharmaceutical company. He also serves on a number of biotech boards. Brian Ye is an Anderson graduate from the class of 2013 and is currently a director of strategy and operations at Kite Pharma, a Gilead company, uh, where he works to develop international growth strategies and expansion plans. He's previously a strategy consultant, uh, as well as the founding COO and CFO of Augmetics, a novel telehealth startup. And our moderator today is Sean O'Malley. Sean is an experienced life sciences consultant and partner at Putnam Associates. Prior to joining Putnam, he was an oncology research scientist and consultant at LEK Consulting, uh, and also spent several years in industry at Genentech. And with that, Sean, I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Dave. And we all really appreciate the opportunity that you're giving us to talk to um, your audience and to, um, to, you know, to speak on, on topics that I think are going to be near and dear to everyone's heart. Um, so I, I guess maybe we'll just start it off with a, you know, a, a thing that's very much in the news um, uh, and think through, you know, I guess, what are your perspectives on the ways in which COVID has impacted the consuming of healthcare? Um, and what do you think are the more temporary impacts versus the more permanent impacts that um, you know we'll, we'll see you know over the next three to five years come once we come out of this crisis? Who would you like to begin? Yeah. Anyone want to take that up? Sure. Uh, let me let me start off. Um, Look, from my perspective, there were two major impacts that occurred. First is, is around clinical trials. We had to do a lot of workarounds. Um, things were delayed, canceled, pushed out. And look, we we're very, um, a very sort of entrepreneurial bunch. We'll, we'll figure out how to do these things and do the clinical trials. But um, there were losses in efficiency because of this. I think this will have two major impacts downstream. Uh, but you'll see the delay on uh, product approvals, which translates to delayed therapies reaching patients, which I would argue in some cases, the damage will be irreparable. The damage of uh, disease, the diseases keep, continue to march forward despite you know, our ongoing uh, clinical delays. And, and I truly, you know, I, I kind of worry about what happens over the next three to five years. I think we're going to see spikes in, in disease deaths directly due to a number of things, the delayed trials, the delayed approvals, um, delayed treatments perhaps, and people are kind of pulling back a little bit or have pulled back during COVID of, um, with uh, taking the correct diagnostics. A lot of the diseases are curable. We have to take a diagnostic test to find out what you have and get ahead of it. And so I, I think all of those things will be, will be coming to the fore soon enough. On the opposite side of the curve, since I, you give both the good and the bad, um, on the good side of the curve, I, I will tell you, it, it gives me great pleasure and, and great pride to know that the biotech industry was involved in, in helping to find a vaccine. Um, it, in my mind, kind of underscores if we all work together, industry, government, people in general, we, we can accomplish great things. Um, but we need to work together on this and get it done. And, and, and I think this is a proof point of, of, of getting it done. 
So I, I guess the, the good news is we, we can't accomplish great things when we all work together. The downside is there's a lot of damage that's been done because of these delays. I would echo uh, Mike's sentiments there. I think the, what we're seeing is really a system that was um, established and kept in place uh, by momentum. Um, but I think we've been forced to become more uh, agile, resilient, flexible. I think those will continue to be themes. We've been forced, for example, in the consumption of care to shift our virtual system. Now, I've done virtual urgent care visits um, in my own business because we offer it in the autologous space. We you know, have had to deal with logistical challenges in, in cell therapy. Uh, while commercial does lead the way as is typical in biopharma, you know, you don't have a business unless your supply chain and your IT systems are also up to snuff. So they're equal partners at that sense. And I think all were tested, right? And if you finally, in, in, the, in a more specific context of COVID, <clears throat> despite some of the latest findings that Pfizer's vaccine can be, you know, uh, uh, put in uh, more traditional freezers as opposed to deep freezers, um, you know, the, the sub-zero cold chain was sorely tested because it was not, I think, a a point of emphasis before. So we see a lot of these things that we've taken for granted that we've perhaps perfected an, an efficient supply chain. In. And really what you need to begin to think about is what are your backups, what's your resiliency plan along that front and the ability to pivot between the two, not necessarily to uh, fix it on one is going to be critical to building a resilient business in the future. Right. Absolutely. Troy, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, Sean, thus far. Um, I think in our, across the companies that I'm, you know, associated with, we've seen a real drawdown in patients coming to clinic to the point that Mike was making. Um, when people are scared to leave their houses, they're scared to go and get medical care. And that includes, you know, screening. Um, and I do think we're going to see, unfortunately, over the next several years, you know, repercussions from that. Um, I think that's inevitable. Um, uh, that will eventually come back when people feel that, you know, they can go out and about again in society. I, I don't think we're there yet, uh, judging by what we're seeing. On the positive side, um, this was the first demonstration we've seen where, uh, this was a, a point that um, was made earlier. We went from the elucidation of a genetic sequence of a virus to a vaccine in less than a year. That's, and, and we not only went to the vaccine, but then started distribution. That's remarkable. That progress is going to stay with us for the years to come, probably mostly relevant to antivirals and, and, and anti-infectives, mm -hmm. but it, it really speaks to some of these emerging technologies. And one of the things that makes me very optimistic about the sector is, uh, you know, we're now a mature sector. We've been around 40 years. Um, uh, and you're starting to see some of these technologies really come into their own and really be able to provide meaningful benefits to large segments of the population. And so it's, it's good to actually, you know, it's good to be able to celebrate that success uh, worldwide, you know, against a backdrop where we're typically talking about pricing and availability and a whole lot of other issues. It's, it's nice to see the science triumph for once. Mm -hmm. I, I guess when you think about the, you know, the goodwill that's been generated there, may, you know, maybe let's let's start out on the positive side. What, you know, what has been what has been accomplished is, as you say, remarkable. Right? We have never done this before, and and yet we have done it over the last year. What are the uses? you know, that we as an industry, you think should, should put that goodwill too. I, I guess what, what do you think we should do with that good feeling that has been generated, you know, and, and especially over the, let's say uh, over the rollout and, and hopefully the, the continued uptake of, of the vaccines. I, I think our industry is at its best when we are going after diseases of high unmet need and trying to make a big difference, right? It's very hard to argue it's very hard for society not to find a way to support that and pay for it. When we are doing incremental improvement, um, it's really easy to, you know, in, at a time when 
people are struggling to make ends meet, it's really hard to justify that. It's nice to see the pendulum swing back to people are tackling problems that were considered insurmountable, right? Genetic diseases, <clears throat> ecology. Now we're, you know, who would have thought uh, you'd see all the innovation in neuroscience? I think that's going to pay big dividends. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, I think that's when we're at our best. What will be interesting is there's been, and, and we'll, I think we'll talk about this later in the session, there has been such a tsunami of capital that has come into the sector. It'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out, right? You have many, many companies chasing the same diseases. From a patient standpoint, that's great. From a, you know, uh, best use of societal resources, we might question that. Uh, but I think I, I'm very optimistic for patients over the next 20 to 30 years. I would echo, I think, a lot of those sentiments and in, in, in sort of the same line. I think it um, actually lends itself to a, a realization that we're not just chasing the next um, you know, Lipitor with some billion of dollars of sales. This is not purely a, a, a volume and numbers of zeros game. It's really around the uh, patient experience and are there are there unmet needs being addressed? And that sort of goes in two fronts. One is looking at the um, unmet needs, right? Maybe from an orphan disease perspective, just to be specific about one thing, but also understanding that the transaction is not merely a B2B one from let's say ourselves to a wholesaler or, or to a customer in some other cases, like a provider institution, but more so considering the entire value chain of the patient at its center. I mean, we've seen that time again from developing technology that Troy alluded to with monitoring, uh, you know, uh, monitoring for CRS or neurotoxicity with COVID side effects, with, um, with uh, building on a better experience um, with, um, I think, being able to consume any care at all. Um, and certainly the experience with the vaccine we all has not really been the most positive, but I think there's stuff to learn from there as well and how uh, one goes about signing up, goes about determining eligibility, goes about uh, making their appointment and getting their uh, vaccines, right? So I think, I think that's, where, um, uh, that's where it's taking us. Yeah, I wouldn't add too much more to that. I, the, the only thing, since you touched on orphan drugs and ultra orphans, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what Genzyme made its, uh, made its bones on. Um, Henry Tamir, you know, um, when he formed the company, he focused predominantly on, on orphan and ultra orphans. And I think it's sort of, it, it started with the understanding that every patient and every disease is important regardless of size of market. And I think if anything happened during this, this COVID event, it sort of redoubled on that. Um, we, we spent a lot of time at Genzyme and Capital thinking about the, the meshing of individualized patient care. In other words, getting diagnostics together with therapeutics. And in my mind, it, you know, it, 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 maybe we did it for fashion back then, but it's probably more important now. Um, that's, to key, that's the key to these things, right? Having diagnostic techniques working in lockstep with targeted therapeutics. Um, we're close. I would argue we're very close. I mean, right now we have the next stage of, I would argue, on oncology diagnostics will be blood-based tests, right? They'll tell you not only do you have a, 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 a cancer, that they'll tell you the type and where it exists. And then you bring in the targeted mm -hmm. therapeutics to address that cancer in a very focused way and then go back and do the, the diagnostic again. So if we've learned, I would argue, anything from this event, the diagnostics have to go lockstep with the therapeutics in order for all of this to work in sort of a closed loop system. Mm -hmm. Understood. Understood. I, I guess, you know, maybe picking up a little bit of that point, but also going back to, you know, all of the, the built up lag that has happened over the past year of, of folks not being comfortable or not being able to go into their, you know, into their physicians and their health screens. Is there any way to make up that lag? Right. Um, <laughs> is there any way? Is there any way to get people screened, you know, for chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease? Like, is there is there any way to do that in a way that will make up for that societal lag? That I, I mean, I, I think you're quite yeah. right. The screening has mm -hmm. gone by the wayside over the last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. I mean, it, it depends on the type of screening and the disease, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sit on the board of directors of Exact Science. We have a, a product called Colagard, which d does screening for uh, colon cancer. And colon cancer is treatable, but, but you got to know you got it, right? And so, so those folks that have sort of kicked that can down the road over the last year, the disease doesn't know that. 
right? It continues chugging along. So the damage is being done. Um, I don't think you can make it up. I mean, you know, hopefully you can kind of catch those patients and, and still you know, do some treatments that are, that are worth anything. But the whole point of, of, of therapies is to catch it early enough before the, the, the damage is more permanent. Um, I wish there were a way to, to make it up, uh, but, but I, I, I can't think of any, which is why I was shaking my head side to side. I, I, I'm sort of, go ahead, Troy. No, I was just going to say, I'd agree with what Mike's saying. I think the healthcare system is still in crisis management mode. Mm -hmm. And until that ends, um, mm -hmm. I don't even think they can get, or, you know, you have, you have frontline uh, healthcare workers that have been going nonstop for months on end. Mm -hmm. At some point we need to give them a break. And um, I, I, there will be a slow, steady reset of the system, but I don't, I'm, I'm not optimistic. You're going to make up that lag that you described. I don't think we're going to make up that clinical lag either. What I do think I see as a potential accelerator is the acceptance of certain technologies, uh, whether diagnose, whether say a serum-based diagnostic or a wearable diagnostic, wearable or technology-based diagnostic in some way, where you know those are more accepted, and not only that, they're incentivized for use. Right? I mean the 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 reimbursement of such things, the acknowledgement of the clinical rigor and validity of them, hopefully uh, provides a wider net if you will, to catch some of those patients who otherwise would not have been in the traditional sort of cadence-based uh, screening model. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, so I unfortunately I agree with the short-term outlook. I do think in the long-term there, there may be an accelerating factor to that. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Um, let's see, I, I guess I'd like to, mm -hmm. I'd like to turn to, you know, one of the points that, um, uh, that I think Troy made earlier um, you know, and, and specifically around the, you know, the infusion of capital into, you know, into biopharma and, and diagnostics and, and other parts of this industry. I, I guess, you know, obviously um, there's been a huge infusion of capital, especially over the last, you know, year and the IPO market has continued to pace. Um, what, you know, what do you think the prospects for that are continuing throughout this year and the next and you know what? What do you think that does to um, early stage companies, and you know where they might go from here? Yeah. Uh, so look, I think the the Trump administration and the, and the Biden administration have made it clear that 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 interest rates aren't going anywhere soon. That that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, equally, Yellen has sort of signaled that she cares a, a little bit about inflation, but but not a whole heck of a lot. Given those two factors, the money is not going to be held on the sidelines. I think the word tsunami was used in the past. Whatever, whatever a big tsunami would be, I think there's, there's, there's that amount of capital being deployed in the equity market. It'll make it easier to form and, and run early stage bio. But, but again, there's a vast amount of money that's necessary. I, I, I don't know the exact figure. I think it was last time I looked, it was one point. Four billion to take a compound to the market, and that's not talking about break even. That's just talking about taking mm -hmm. it to the market. So I think there'll be less concerns about capital. Um, what I am concerned about is 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 people who run these things. It, the, the, the human capital is there, there's a a dire need for people to actually do these things. Mm -hmm. um, the money isn't the issue. I, I have to tell you, try to find a a clinical person in Boston is, is virtually impossible. Same, same with manufacturing and the same with, you know, somebody to run these things, CEOs, CFOs, mm -hmm. you will find a lot of companies that are being run either centrally or with, you know, one CEO taking on two or three, two or three companies, because there's not a lot of people to run these things. So mm -hmm. if there's a constraint, mm -hmm. I would argue the constraint is on the human capital rather than on, on money. You, the, the money will be available. And I think the money will be available at least, let's, let's peg a time, mm -hmm. at least throughout this year. And, and you know what, next year I'll come back and you'll tell me, Mike, what happened in June. But, but, but I think it'll be available mm -hmm. at least through this year because of the, you know, the, the, the interest rates and the, the lack of caring about inflation. But that won't be the issue. The issue will be about uh, getting people to actually do these things because it's very tough. I don't know how it is in the West Coast. I assume it's about the same. I'd say it's about about the right also. I, I would echo the point about the money. I think there is certainly 
um, and a, a desire to invest in the space that's proven critical to combating COVID. Um, I would say on top of the, the capital, right? I'm, 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 look, I'm thinking about, you know, there are in South every we have three commercial companies, ourselves, Novartis, and, and as of a couple of weeks ago, BMS Elgene. Um, and that's something to the tune of 300 plus clinical stage companies. Um, the issue there is despite those numbers, despite the promise, a lot of them are gonna fall out. And so I think the question becomes, does this new money understand the implications of investing in you know, complex therapies and, and, and orphans or ultra orphans and, and those sort of diseases? Because it just because the money there doesn't ensure the success and money just ensures the ability to remove uncertainty from the performance of a therapeutic, right? And if it doesn't perform, it doesn't perform. So uh, I think whether it stays um, is going to be a question of understanding the differences and norms of investing in this industry, uh, particularly if there's, there are now those who have not considered biopharma in the past. So I think that's one of the, the key behavioral aspects of providing the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean, I, again, I agree with, with much of what Brian and Mike said. Um, you know, we've seen unprecedented <laughs> fiscal stimulus, very low interest rates. There's the old joke, in a stiff wind, even a turkey can fly. Um, you know, we, we, uh, I don't see it turning around anytime soon. What's interesting is if you look at mm -hmm. the public biopharma companies, <clears throat> bimodal distribution, there are uh, about half the companies are really at risk of running out of capital and the other half are just, uh, you know, better funded than they've ever been before. Um, and, and I think that's going to continue, right? Because mm -hmm. investors want to zero out financing risk. Um, what, uh, and this, this builds on something that Mike was saying, um, and, and we do have the same challenges on the West Coast that they have in Boston. Cura is actually mm -hmm. based in both San Diego and Boston. Um, and, you know, if, if there's time, we can talk about how the work environment in biopharm is changing uh, because we are having to be more flexible to get good talent. But on the company side, I think what we're seeing is a removal of financing risk, but an increase in execution risk. And um, I don't, you know, the, that, that's a great place for the specialists, the hedge funds, um, it's a, it can be a difficult place for generalists because it doesn't take more than two or three big blowups for, for sentiment to turn. But I, I would say, you know, as an operator, as someone who builds companies and, and grows companies, boy, is it a good time to be in biopharma. <laughs> you know, I've never seen it as good and I've been doing this for 25 years. And you're seeing companies, you know, I joked, uh, you know, what was an IPO 10 years ago is now a series A round. You're getting 100, 150 million dollar Series A rounds, yep. and and there's certainly been an inflation in the cost of doing the basic business, but you've also seen a consolidation of these massive investment mm -hmm. vehicles, hedge funds mm -hmm. that are 10, 20 billion dollars in assets. They can't make five million dollar bets. That isn't going to move the needle. So they really have to make big bets, and they and they want to do again back to what we were talking about before, transformative science. I think it's a great time. The human capital issue, that's going to be a recurring problem. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a surmountable problem, I think. Yeah. So let me tease that out a little bit. Do you think that because there are new investors coming in and because there is so much money out there, um, what I worry about a little bit is the fundamentals. Um, they, they, are, are they investing for, uh, and I'll use the word fashion, Right? Uh, are they? It, 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 let, let's all get on the oncology chidget boat and go that way. Um, and and I do worry about that because there are wonderful technologies that might not be mm -hmm. in favor right now, or might not be in fashion, that are left to the side. And I think that explains just sort of the the, mm -hmm. the haves and the have-nots of the world. Um, mm -hmm. If people are intrigued by technology, they tend to be a little bit like lemmings and all go to one one direction over another. Um, I do worry about that because there are a lot of good companies that are underfunded right now too. I agree with you, Mike. And I mean, the best funded segment, the best performing segment of biotech last year was the IPO market, right? Yeah. Which makes no sense based yeah. on what we know historically. Half yeah. of those companies will, will crash and burn, but it was, you know, it was a great year. And mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, you know, investors often chase return um, mm -hmm. and it'll take a while. I agree with you. There, there is a risk 
uh, of, of valuations getting overinflated, um, expectations get or, or you know expectations getting too far ahead, and then you get that inevitable disappointment. And when it whips back, it's ugly. Um, yeah. And I, I I agree with you. I don't know you know I don't know what the society or the market can bear in terms of some of these targets where you, you're talking comp- you know 12, 13, 14 different companies developing a, a product against the same target. There's no way the healthcare system mm-hmm. can absorb that. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. But but um, I you know it, it's uh, the healthcare business is still a good place to invest relative to mm-hmm. real estate, construction, yep. retail. Mm-hmm. And these, these investors have to put money somewhere. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think right now our industry is mm-hmm. the beneficiaries and it, it allows good operators to really build great teams, assemble an amount of money where, you know, at Cura, we have about, you know, we have over 600 million in cash. We burned 60 million uh, approximately, you know, in 2020. Uh, now our burn is going up, but but that puts us in a very strong financial position to be able mm-hmm. to just put our head down and execute, and yeah. that's a great place to be. Yeah, I also, I, you know, I, I'm not quite, I, I'm not quite sure I've reconciled my thoughts on on SPACs, but there are somewhere in the order of 190 mm-hmm. SPACs looking for a home, looking for a reverse merger, and and those are yet another tsunami of of businesses that'll be that'll be coming out too. Um, it, it'll it'll be an interesting, hmm. uh, almost a sobering up period next year. I think. See see how this it, all shakes out. I mean, I think it sort of goes to um, any any sort of new excitement and new, to your point, uh, fashionable area to invest in, where there are perhaps some experienced investors or also some neophytes. But really, what get what it gets down to is your diligence and understanding of the science behind it. And I forget who made the point uh, of how we are prioritizing science again, um, but. You do have to actually understand this, right? Because you're, you're you're rarely going to see a publication that says, "Oh, our, our, our you know, phase one didn't work out, and this was the reason why." There's really typically some sort of positive announcement of some way. But if you look, if you really dig into data and how they cut the things, I think that level of, um, of analysis is going to be critical in picking the winners, and therefore, I think hopefully sustaining the successful IPOs and successful commercial launches of drugs. That continue to feed upon that that goodwill that Sean sort of highlighted here, um, and you know, unfortunately, it's sort of this um, uh, aspect of human behavior to always jump into what's sort of hot or perceived as hot at, at the moment. Where I, I remember the better part of a decade ago, I think the valuations were let's say twenty x for biopharma, and maybe two or three x for medtech. And actually, up until recently, I think that actually flipped to something like mm-hmm. ten to fifteen for medtech, and actually you know five to six for biopharma. Because people realized that the original pool of uh, more so legacy investors, biopharma was hard to do. And medtech is actually not that different, given the convergence of, of I guess, commercial tech with um, with uh, with clinical grade uh, devices. And so that led to more certainty uh, in the process. And so I think we're going to see us all back and forth on that. It, it really comes down to: Are you making smart investments or not? Uh, and so, do you have the right advisors conducting that diligence? Agreed. And I, I do want to come back around to I, on this point about, you know, doing strong due diligence. I, I do want to come back around to a point that Troy made earlier, um, you know, talking about execution risk being greater. And I, I, I'm interested, I, I guess, what what do you mean by that? And where do you think the, the major sources of risk are there sort of going forward? Yeah, what I meant by that, Sean, is... Um... You know, so if, if you're an investor, your first filter, at, at least an investor in the public markets, right? Let, let's leave the private markets aside for a second. In the public markets, your first filter is, is the company going to have to raise capital again before I get to a meaningful value inflection point? And if the answer to that is yes, you probably will put those companies aside because who wants to take the risk of that? Then your next question is, okay, how do I de-risk the decision making and the execution that the, the, the you know the clinic the preclinical and clinical studies that are going on, in my opinion, the only way you do that is as Brian was saying with very good due diligence and a portfolio approach. Because if any of us, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know the secret to you know always you know batting a thousand. It, that just isn't this business, um, and 
particularly in an environment where, you know, take oncology, the standards of care are changing so rapidly that you'll start a study. By the time you've completed the study, the standard of care has changed underneath you. It's a challenging place to be. And so it puts a real premium on Mm -hmm. teams that can both think strategically and execute tactically. And that's what I mean by execution risk. And that goes to what Mike was saying about, about leadership. And it's not just leader, you know, operating within the realm of large pharma is one thing, right? You're, you're typically insulated. You know, you can, you can think longer term. In a biotech company, whether you like it or not, you know, the, 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 the hedge funds, um, you know, the, 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 the algos are going to be following you not only every quarter, but like they're asking, okay, you, they say, well, what are your catalysts? And you say, great, mm-hmm. here are our catalysts for 2021. And they say, no, no, the catalyst for the month of March, right? Yeah. Like, Wait a minute, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, and there's a, and, and look, they, they play a, a valuable role in the system, but it puts a real premium on mm-hmm. leadership teams that can execute and help to manage the street's expectations, right? Because this is difficult work. And, and I, the teams that do it best consistently under promise and over deliver. And, and they're, they're not flashy about it. They just, you know, if you just execute, you will be in the top 10, 10 you know, the top decile of performance. Uh, but, but it's a skill and it's one that, that takes time to learn in the sort of SMID cap mm-hmm. environment. Mm-hmm. And I guess, are there, you know, Mike talked about the um, the challenges of the human capital um, and and how to get you know good teams working together towards that goal and and as you say managing risk and uh, in an appropriate way and managing uh, expectations I, I guess mm-hmm. you know it, it seemed as if you know you might have thought those human capital um, uh, challenges are, are are addressable. I guess how do we address them? What's you know what's the best way to do that? And I, I mean for people on the call today, I, you know what what are the implications for them? You know going forward in their careers, what you know what do you think uh, mm-hmm. what do you think they can do to help move that forward? I, I think he really oh, go ahead, Brian. So right, no worries. I I think it. Um, I think as we move into more complex diagnostics, gene therapy, cell therapies, you know, some of those uh, emerging spaces, I think when you, to, to maybe answer your question in two ways, like the human capital availability is one where it, there's almost, almost a, an incestuous type of uh, environment in certain you know, emerging markets where, you know, I'll use cut as an example, a lot of our um, original team members are in a lot of the smaller companies. And so they, sort of perpetuate um, a, their expertise around it, which is great. Um, but we also need to think about building the pool of talent because it's such a complex field we're in and we can't continue to, you know, hire around to fill the same roles. And maybe it comes to, the, to Mike's point where you have like two, two uh, persons sitting on a couple different companies, but that only works at a certain point. You have to really respect the, the vagaries and nuances of the operation behind that. I guess so my second point is, uh, when one looks at one's career, and I'm s- setting this in the context of a business school, right? Um, I think you have to appreciate the delicacies and intricacies of and of operations behind what you're trying to do, be it diagnostics or thera- therapeutics or digital, or whatever, to make that strategic uh, decision and choice. Because yeah, I think the um, the old days of merely assessing a market in terms of you know, epidemiology and you know, transfer tax or something along those lines are, are well and well and beyond us at this point. I think the realities of how we bring therapies to market these days and continue to grow all our companies relies on things such as data privacy, regulatory, um, getting through um, regulatory at, a, at an acceptable pace. Um, and so you have to, if you're going to be a functional person, be very specialized in the operative, but also regardless of whether you're functional or strategic, understand the implications of making that decision on more than just a single market, a single therapeutic, a single indication, right? And, and so it puts a bigger onus on the multifaceted ability of someone, if not to be a master, then to be uh, cognizant of and aware of the implications around different functions. That's the type of person I think it will take to, uh, to succeed um, as we uh, fight through the talent crunch. 
John, I see t sort of two major risks around human capital uh, to your mm -hmm. question. Uh, the first is, and this is a, kind of a continuation of what we were talking about before, companies now are financed to be able to go from discovery to, through to commercialization. And that's in fact what investors want to see. Um, you know, they, they want you to be able to execute. The hope is that a larger company is going to come in in an acquisition scenario and, and you know, and there's, and there's going to be a, a retilling of the soil, but they are, but the investment community is, is financing companies to be able to go all the way to the market. What does that mean? That means you have to have a team that can actually do discovery, development, regulatory, you know, all of the pre-marketing and commercialization and execute at a high level. Back when I got in this business, like commercialization was something those big pharma companies did, right? We built companies that they would buy. <laughs> And they worried about how to commercialize it. You don't get to do that anymore. Now you have to be thinking ahead. And this is where combining strategy, you know, strategic thinking with tactical execution is important. Um, these are not science projects. These are going to be products that are going to go out and need to not only help patients, but be uh, revenue generating in the market. That's mm -hmm. risk number one. How do you in, even in a company of 100, 150 people, do you have the talent base to be able to do that, right? That's question mm -hmm. number one. And I think that's an area of risk. The other area of risk is a, is a, is a more uh, near-term phenomenon. And that is, at least in the companies that I'm associated with, people are exhausted. They're, you know, this is a great format, but people are tired of Zoom meetings. They wanna be able to meet in person. They're struggling with children out of school in many cases you know, loved ones that they have to care for, I, we're finding our teams are just exhausted. And you need to be able to give them breaks because they're, they're, they're running the risk of burnout. It's easy, we've had our employees say, look, if we're not careful, we get stacked up with 14, you know, Teams meetings or Zoom meetings in a day. Mm -hmm. and there's no, not even a chance to like make a sandwich. <clears throat> so one of the things I think as an industry we're gonna have to do is to migrate to a world where I don't, I personally don't know that we're ever going to go back to everyone is in the office from nine to five, five days a week. I think we're going to find a, an environment where people spend some time together when they need to collaborate. They spend some time remotely. And you, as a, as, if you're taking care of your human capital, you need to be making sure that people are rested and that they are able to be productive and they're not overwhelmed. That's the other element of human risk. And the reality is if they're not, if you don't do that, they're going to go somewhere else because it is a highly liquid market. There's much more demand than there is supply. So those are the two elements of risk on the human capital that, I'd, that I would identify. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with all that. And the only, the, only, the only other touching point would be, how, so how do we augment the supply to equal that demand? And, 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 and it, you know, at, at, at Genzyme, Years ago, Henry Tamir being a Dutch guy, and he was, by the way, if you ever want to talk about a hellish job, uh, imagine working for a Dutch economist as a CFO, it just couldn't have been. Any <laughs> we'll redact that out of the recording. But anyways, so, so, but he had some novel ideas on how to manage things. And for years, I, I didn't have anything on my card. It just said my name, mm -hmm. which was a little funny. Um, and in, in his, his, his thought was, look, if you walk in and say you're the CFO or something, you're kind of locked into having CFO or executive vice president discussions. You might have an opinion on manufacturing. So mm -hmm. go for it. So, so I think that in, in the germ of, of that discussion is mm -hmm. we need to open up the funnel on what we aspire to have people do and keep it a little more loose than here's your card, here's your pen, here's your pocket protector. You are now a biologist and you're working in clinical. Go, go sit with the clinical mm -hmm. folks. Um, so we have to be more, I guess, more <clears throat> collaborative than that. And then secondarily, I would argue, we need to open up the funnel with regard to where we find our talent. Uh, I get it. There's a lot of smart people in Harvard and MIT. They tell me this all mm -hmm. the time, all the time. I, I bet we could find some smart people in those places that we fly over and, and you're on the West coast. I'm on the East coast. My understanding is, is this, 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 this Idaho, I don't know, Ohio, there's other places in between that we look out the window and see. 
that we have to start mining those talent pools as well. We ke- just can't keep going back to the same people at the same time and then been boning our faith that we don't have enough supply. So I think we have to open up the aperture and give them the tools around collaboration, give them the tools around how they do their job, because I, I would argue magic will happen then because we'll get a lot more out of it than we put into it. It's just an opinion. Well, and, and I, I mean, I, what you're saying is very true to my own experience. I, you know, I, I was a, an MBA student a long time ago at the University of Chicago and, you know, who recruited from us, uh, you know, it was Lily, um, yeah. uh, you know, mm-hmm. it was Abbott and that was it, right? The, you know, the larger biopharma were, you know, were not present on campus. Um, I, I guess when you, you know, when you think about, as you say, opening up the aperture, you know, are we are we talking about you know enticing people from um, you know the middle of the country to come out to the coasts? Are we talking about setting up you know outposts you know in in Chicago and Dallas and St. Louis and um, and Indianapolis? I, I, I you know all, I, I would, all of the above, <clears throat> including you know again we should touch on it at some point, including diversity, including how we collaborate around those things. Yeah, it's all of the above because. You know, at at the end of the day, that's where the people are. That's where the talent is. And I can keep going across the street to Harvard and knocking on their door and say, send me your top 10. Swell. And then what? You know, and then what? So so I think that we we have to do all of those things in this remote world has taught us that we can't. You know, you can be in Des Moines, Iowa and and still collaborate with somebody in in Boston. Don't smile. Des Moines is nice. But um but we, you could collaborate with people from Cambridge and even even California. So it, it's okay. We just have to shift our minds a little bit to accepting that it's okay to do that, and keep our keep keep our options open around what we train and how we train these people mm-hmm. to to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. Sean, I think one of your points was around how do you do it as well, and I fully, I fully agree with what Mike is saying. I think. I've certainly seen my team spur across the country and they're doing their jobs just finally come from various different backgrounds. I think that when we're, if we're going to be smart about the money that is coming in and a lot of it goes into clinical, let's say clinical research and or commercial execution, you know, we can't necessarily put outposts in every corner of the country that, uh, you know, or anything like that. I think it really comes down to a partnership, right? Can we partner with, let's say, an educa- like an immuno-oncology graduate program and uh, in the middle of the country um, uh, institution or something like that, right? I mean, I just got news the other day, I think uh, Ohio State um, uh, opened up a new cell therapy uh, institute, cell, cell and gene therapy institute. You know, that's great. That's, that seems like a natural point of collaboration. We have plenty of customers in, on, in that state as well, but you know, could you not do something similar in other at least um, uh, competency uh, 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 strong points across the country, right? I mean, you know, you're not going to put a building in each one, but you, you definitely plant your seeds and you know, there are going to be specialties that come out of uh, a lot of these different institutions that will be not just complementary to what we're currently doing now, but perhaps lay to ground for other things like, you know, allogeneics, all tumors, et cetera, et cetera, uh, at least in my space where, you know, you can't always have even one institution focusing on multiple, right? So I think, uh, it, I think the partnership, both in terms of developing talent as well as ensuring the future of the business is, um, is going to come from a lot of these deals that get put into place and alliances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to add to that, just a little bit, and then, I'm, then I'll be quiet for a while. Um, one of the things that we did uh, was we, we set up an organization for biotech manufacturing because we owned most of the manufacturing um, for biotech manufacturing in Waterford, Ireland. Um, we had this gulf of talent um, in, in that area. Um, so what Waterford University did is mm-hmm. they established a biotech manufacturing major. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, and mm-hmm. I don't want to be as, as, as sort of pragmatic as saying it's like a little conveyor belt, but they kind of came out of the conveyor belt. They walked across the street, worked at our plant. It was, it, it was a wonderful collaboration, yeah. but, mm-hmm. but things of that ilk are, are, are I would argue, is, is how you address this, this supply thing. Now, Mike, I think you bring up a great point, and, and that's actually... It's funny you bring up Ireland as well. I, I've done some work uh, in the previous career with uh, some clients where they looked at Ireland, and this was a med tech, and they actually found that sort of talent is there, but you have to look at, you have to look at the holistic incentives. And mm-hmm. because Ireland is now so used to a lot of the foreign direct investment in that space, the incentives are quite low compared to other countries. And so um, uh, 
these, you look at the burgeoning medtech market in Southeast Asia, and that actually ended up being a better investment point for that facility expansion. So yeah. think about Southeast Asia, you know, what's the first thing that pops into mind? I'll tell you, one of the board of director members thought it was a jungle, all right? It clearly is not. Um, so, and, and it took a family vacation for him to actually see the development in that nation. And so, yeah. you know, we made the case that you should actually place your, your new plant here to service your markets globally and to partner with a lot of local uh, technical and I guess their version of four universities to develop that talent pipeline starting now because you're going to have at least a year of lead time, if not two or three, before you get up to speed on all your operational uh, pieces. Yeah. And that's where you punch out your way out of this, uh, this, this supply crunch that we're facing. Absolutely. Troy, did you have a comment here? I don't think I, I, I appreciate it, Sean. I, I think Mike and Brian handled it well. I'm not sure I would add anything to what's been said. Understood. Of course. Um, let's see. So, um, you know, and, and we can take the, the next thing in terms of um, talent uh, acquisition and, and fostering or, or sort of more broadly across the, the landscape of, of healthcare consumption. But, you know, obviously the pandemic has, you know, laid bare some fundamental inequities in the healthcare system and who has access to it and how people consume it. Um, I, I guess, what do you think the role of biopharma can be and or should be um, in getting to a more equitable healthcare system? Mm -hmm. I think it, um, I, I think there are various aspects to that question. Um, certainly a clinical logistical um, standpoint and access pricing standpoint. Um, I'll, I'll maybe take on one as an example. I mean, if you look at the way clinical trials are run historically, right, it's essentially, you know, white male above the age of 21, right? So what happens when you have to change dosing for female? What happens when you have to look at juveniles or even or pregnant expecting mothers, you know? None of those were traditionally studied because it's easier to recruit off of a single cohort and go from there. And so as we get to more personalized therapies and, you know, the diversity of our, um, uh, of our patient base continues to increase, I don't see that reversing anytime soon. You know, I think we have to re-examine the way we are recruiting, right? Are we... You know, are we going to the Harvards and MITs for, uh, and the med centers for their patients? And by the way, that's unfair to them. I'm just sort of using that as an as a analog of sorts. But um, you know, uh, what, is, what has been the traditional approach? And how do we make sure that we truly understand the epidemiology of what we're studying so that our clinical studies reflect that? And so you know, maybe that lends itself further down to certain pricing and logistical distribution questions as well. These are all going to be analogs of essentially what I said, but I'll you know, defer to Mike and Troy to add more to that. Yeah, and, and by the way, I'm picking on Harvard and MIT only because I can see them across the street. Um, it, it, look, I, I think it, it also starts with um, what I would argue the biotech industry in and of itself. It's not shocking that, you know, it's predominantly, you know, I don't want to the, 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 the sort of poke too hard at this, but it's predominantly a white male gender kind of kind of industry, right? So... So I think that's sort of where it starts. We, we design trials in our own image, as it were. Um, not long ago, that thing bio came up with it, um, that 80% that of, the, uh, of the employees were committed to inclusion in, in inclusion environments. And, and, and that's all fine, but you need to put that in goals and objectives. You have to make that real. Um, so as I said before, you have to open up the funnel for hiring. For example, you have to recruit from a wider range of schools. You have to provide networking opportunities for these folks, both future employees and, and current employees. You need to set high goals for inclusion and diversity, and you need to measure against that. And, and I, I would argue that you can learn a lot from other countries. I, I'm on the board of directors, uh, I chair a board in, in France. Um, they have this novel approach, and, and we'll see how it works out. But in, in order to be on the board of a French company, you need to match board diversity with the general population, right? And if you don't, the first year you get a fine, the second year you're delisted. There's some real teeth in that. So not coincidentally, not surprisingly, they have a lot more diversity, I would argue, than some of the U.S. boards. Uh, again, all of these are starts. But, but I think we need to keep this uh, in top of mind as we do these things because it's important 
And it's not something that we can kind of, again, I've said it before, do for fashion this year and then kind of forget about it and move on to something, the, the new crises next year. This is an important thing. And I think if you get greater diversity at the, at the top in these biotechs, you'll see greater diversity when you start distributing drugs in, to the, in, in patient trials. I guarantee it. Yeah, Sean, it's, um, this, is, this is a tough problem with not a lot of easy solutions. Um, in terms of patient access, that's a th uh, from, from our experience, that's a thorny problem. And the reason it's thorny is that uh, the reality is if you have a tumor and you want next generation sequencing and the latest standard of care, you don't typically go to the community hospital in the south side of Chicago. I wish you did, but that's just the reality. You know, the, the, uh, I'm not entirely sure how to solve that problem. I think that's a societal, you know, that there are policymakers who are smarter and more talented than I am that have to address that, that issue. One thing we could do and should do is to make testing available to all patients. Um, and to remove some of the stigma of testing and the stigma of clinical trials. Patients often don't want, at least in oncology, in, in other areas, it's different. In oncology, patients typically don't want to go on a trial because what that means is everything else has failed. And that's the last thing you have before, you know, before the end. So you really are, are fighting uphill. That's why it's only a very small percentage of patients that actually go on trials. I think in terms of what, what Mike was saying about ensuring that our organizations and our workforce are representative of society at large, there I think we, there is actually a lot we can do. And, we, and, and you're seeing it both by, uh, both, by, both by governments and self-organizing uh, self, um, uh, you know, uh, self associations like NASDAQ. NASDAQ now has rules, right, on board diversity. Um, and Cal state of California has rules on board diversity. Not surprisingly, you're seeing a lot of diversity now on California boards. Um, that's great. What I've challenged my team at Cura to do is let's acknowledge the global problem and let's, let's ask ourselves, what can we do locally? And one of the things that we're trying really hard to do is I've said to, you know, we have, we have tremendously talented employees who really take this very seriously. I've said, great. Go to the high schools, go to the co community colleges, you know, develop, Mike called it a conveyor belt. You know, we can, we can have, you know, half a dozen interns, help them understand the potential career opportunities. Even if they don't end up at Cura or they don't end up in biopharma, they're seeing a different part of the world. And, and when, you, when you open that up and you show them that world exists and they can see mentors and role models, formal or informal, I think... It'll take time, but the, t the change will come relatively quickly. And I know, uh, you know, we're, we're members of the industry organizations in both Boston and San Diego. We're not alone. Hundreds of companies, large and small, are taking similar approaches. So I think if we have this, if we come back in 10 years and have this panel again and ask this question again, I suspect things will look quite a bit different and hopefully much more balanced relative to society at whole. Yeah. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, uh, the, the only the other only additional point I would add is, so so when I left what the, the portion of what my wife calls my real jobs, which was uh, you know full time jobs, um, I, I went away and and I went to go build houses in of all places Armenia for about six months. And what I discovered was I can't fix all the problems, but I can fix some of them. And and, and if we can convince each other that we, some of these things are big. I, I agree with you. They're, they're big, enormous issues that have been systemically part of the United States or worldwide for the bazillion years. We can't fix that. But what we can do is exactly as you said, Troy, we can fix the things that are in front of us. So we as an industry, we can fix these things. We as a board, uh, me as a chairman, I can fix these things. So if you focus on those things that you can fix and get involved in the community, we'll get there. It may take a little bit longer, but we'll get there. I, I just... Mm -hmm. From, from my perspective, and maybe this is the jaundice side of, of an older man, I just don't have a lot of faith that there's going to be a government mandate or a, a state mandate that's going to fix these things. These are fixed from internal. Yeah, yeah just to add to that, Mike, and, and to share something with you in the audience. So, so at Avidity, you know, we went public last year. We've been building out the board. The, mm -hmm. you know, the investors have, have 
are, are rolling off. Uh, Sarah Boyce leads the organization. You know, she's she's a uh, she's actually a Brit. <laughs> um, she you know she came from Exia and from Ionis, but we recently recruited Jean Kim, formerly from Deerfield, and Tamar Thompson from Alexion on the board. And by the first board meeting, I chair the board. You know, it's they just have really different, interesting experiences, and it's mm-hmm. it's it's really remarkable and refreshing to see. And, and again, I think you'll see that more and more, both because people realize it's the right thing to do. And you have these, you know, these bumpers, if you will, mm-hmm. from society that are pushing us in that direction. So, yeah, exactly. I'm yeah, I am too. I would, I, you know, again, on the board of directors of, uh, so I'm the chairman, as I mentioned, of this, of this uh, board in, in Paris. And w- when I first joined it, we had two, two folks from the UK, Abingsworth. Uh, we had one uh, one Swiss Italian. We had two French and me. You want diversity? Um, you know, they they go back to, you know, uh, sometimes. Well, we got you know we, we went sideways in the Battle of Hastings. Now, so that was ten sixty six guys. Can we move on? Um, so, but 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 it's that kind of culture that we need to get in U.S. companies as well. So you question things. You have this mm-hmm. you have this commonality. You have this respect for each other, and that's the way you build it out. I, I framed that up in sort of just two considerations, right? The first thing is, is overarching. It's going to take a long time to shift um, just because you don't flip the switch on these things. But I think what I'm hearing also is that, you know, there's a top down need to set that tone and you can do that through some board appointments and, and all that. But you also need to build a sustaining uh, body of talent or, or mm-hmm. uh, perspectives, if you will, by continuing to build a conveyor belt of, of talent underneath. So yeah. Yeah, that, that, that conveyor belt comment is going to stick, isn't it? And we use it now later. <laughs> My apologies. They're calling card. <laughs> um, let's see. So I, I think we just have a couple of minutes left and we are going to try to end on time at 15 to the hour because I know there's there's a mm-hmm. schedule of keynotes and such. Um, I, I guess one final question, um, you know, as, as a lot of folks on the phone, you know, let, let's hope they're thinking this um, and thinking about the industry. Um, you know, if you had one piece of advice for someone who wants to come in um, and have a long career and um, a lot of success and maybe make their way up to the C-suite of a, of a biopharma, you know, what do you say? Hmm. It, you know, I guess the, 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 the traditional answer is, well, follow your passion. Um, I, mm-hmm. I, I disagree with that. I think that's the, that's the goofiest advice ever. ever. Um, I, I would say that you need to hang on to your passion because this is a passionate business. Mm-hmm. You, you have to have a belief in, in these things. In, in, and I would argue that the, neither the biotech or any industry is, is in charge of passion 101. You're, you're in charge of that. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking for your life's dreams in a company, you're probably going to be disappointed. I would say that the most successful people in this mm-hmm. industry or any industry is, is jump into the deep end, bring your passion to work rather than expect it to, to find it at the doorstep and do your best every day. Um, you do this, you'll be successful. You'll be successful, not only in this business, you'll be successful everywhere. But it, it, it is truly bringing your passion mm. in, in what you will, will see is a, it is a frustrating long haul industry. You keep, the, you, you, you keep that around you, you'll be fine. Yeah. I, I think that if you, maybe to preference on what Mike said, if you follow your passions, unless you're really founding a company making it over in your own image, you're really not going to, get to that point, I think it's about, is this company's mission aligned to what I would want to do, right? And so maybe it's about curing cancer, maybe it's a focus on infectious diseases, you know, maybe it's, and maybe it's based off of family history, right? So you have some tangible tie to that. Um, find that mission and be open to the path to get you there. I think typically in biopharma industry, people think a zigzag path to the top. It's not a straight line. I will say, that typically those in clinical and commercial tend to be CEOs. That's not to say you can't be on the C-suite um, with any other function, but just sort of know that um, and see what sort of zigzag path you take gets you to that point. I'm just like, it's not a straight line, but you do have semblance, some semblance to lateral and diagonal your way up um, as far as your career goes. So. Absolutely. Troy, last thoughts? Yeah, I, I was going to make a joke and say, follow your passion, but, but my, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I do think there is a lot of passion in the industry. I would say find people that you feel you can trust and you can learn from. 
find people who have been successful before, think about your career in one, three, and five-year increments, establish a network of formal and informal mentors, and don't be afraid to, to but either jump in when you don't know something, to Mike's point, or put your hand up and say, I'm willing to do that. I think this is something we should do. This is a business of, of initiative. It's a business of innovation. Those are the people that, you know, that ultimately end up at the top. It's the, is the, the risk takers, the people who are willing to see a problem and say, I don't even, I don't know how to solve it, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to learn as much as I can and try. And it's a wonderful, it, it, I can't imagine doing anything else. It's the most amazing industry, I think, on the planet. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Brian, Mike, Troy. We really appreciate all of your insights and all of your thoughts. And I, I, hope, I hope we are all able to be in person next year um, on a stage in, in, front of, in front of everybody who's on the call right now. So be safe. Good luck. And thank you so much for participating. We really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us.